habeas corpus. No, it does not mean to live in a corpse. Nobody knows what it means. It's Latin or something. But to lawyers like me, especially defense lawyers like me, it is a writ that guarantees each and every one of us the right to a fair trial. What is a fair trial? Hmm. What is a fair trial? Well, members of the jury, my esteemed colleagues, and dare I say, my friends, I would like to introduce you to two of my favorite phrases in the American language. The first, plausible deniability. What does that mean? I don't know. I wasn't there. Is it plausible? Yes. Is it deniable? You bet your last two cents it is. My second favorite phrase in the American language. Beyond reasonable doubt. Beyond reasonable doubt. Beyond two go further than something to go beyond as a verb. Reasonable, something that is fair. Doubt, deniability. Doubt, a shred of instinct telling you that something is not as it seems. In my closing statement today, we'll be taking a look at the charges set forth against my client. Are they true? Who knows? What is truth? Truth is that I skipped breakfast today because I had to come to work to defend an innocent man. Truth is that I got several parking violations recently. Truth is that I live on the planet Earth and am not ticklish. Truth is in the heart of the beholder. Truth is subjective unless you lived it. Anything else is anecdotal. So the truth <clears throat> in this case is only known by my client. And my client has pleaded not guilty. Not guilty. So that is the truth. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, you cannot have truth alone. Truth alone is an anecdote. You need to combine truth with evidence to support it. And that is where we find that my client's truth a plea of not guilty is the truth, the whole truth. And nothing but the truth. So, esteemed members of the jury, dare I say, friends, 
let us take a look at the evidence. Exhibit A. A stapler. Don't worry. It's not loaded. Now. A simple office item. Or a deadly weapon. Now, my adversaries would have you believe that my client used a stapler. Not unlike this one. In fact, this exact stapler. To staple the victim to a wall. As our expert witness testified to you all, the representative of stationery from the stationery conglomerate in Belgium, Europe, it would take no less than 3.5 thousand staples to successfully hold a person in place if injected into specific areas of the person or cadaver. A standard stapler has an ammo capacity of around a thousand. So, Friends of the jury, you have to ask yourself, would my client be capable of, one, holding the victim up against the wall for an extended period of time, two, have the financial capacity to buy around about 15 reams of staples, and such an elegant chrome finish silver with brassed and release mechanism on the base stapler and connect said victim to a wall made of concrete. All of a sudden the prosecution's argument that this very stapler was used to pin down the victim becomes a little unbelievable. So I remind you, my friends, is it plausible? No. Is it deniable? Absolutely. Is there fact beyond reasonable doubt? that my client used this beautiful chrome stapler to affix a human to a wall made of concrete. I don't think so. And I think you, especially you, agree with me. Exhibit 2. A wooden brush. Now the um, prosecution <clears throat> would have you believe that my client used this brush after stapling 
the victim to a wall after that fact. Then use this brush to gently comb through the hair of the victim in some kind of sordid representation of sexual repression and desire. Now, this brush made of a delicate pine, hollow to the touch, with an air compressor to help with brushing and to allow for supple contouring around different shapes of the body. Wooden nodules used for the brushing itself that make a pleasing sound when applied. Would one even consider such an act, such an act to be torture? It sounds nice to me, and I think it sounds nice to you. More to the point, the victim's hair color is blonde. And if we get right in here and pull out some of the residual hair, as you can plainly see, it's black. To conclude, this brush could not have been used on the victim, could not have been used to gently, meticulously, and caringly brush the victim's hair. The fact that this is a brush for demonstrative purposes only is irrelevant to the case. Inadmissible take away the in. You're allowed in. This brush represents the idea of care. A care that a callous killer surely couldn't express or convey. Timothy McVeigh. No. I think you'll find that this brush, although specifically not used in the crime, was not used in the crime. Item number I, I, I. And bear with me, folks. This is where it gets a little strange. feather. Hmm. Joyous. Soft. Almost ethereal. The prosecution, <laughs> yep, those guys again, would have you believe that this feather was brought down across the face of the victim before the execution. What an odd thing to do. One, where would my client acquire such a feathery cloud, soft item such as this? Two, why? Three, why now? I cannot talk for everyone in this courtroom. Certainly can't talk for you. You're unique. But what I can say is that I am not ticklish. I made that clear at the beginning of this closing statement. Now, if I'm not ticklish, 
why would I brush this soft, luxurious feather down the eyes of my victim prior to killing them, execution style? Curiouser and curiouser. The simple answer is, my client did none of these things. Is it plausible? Uh, maybe. Is it deniable? Absolutely. Beyond reasonable doubt, is this something that my client could do or did do? No. And that brings us on to the final exhibit, <clears throat> or as I like to refer to it, the ultimate exhibit. very warm in the courthouse today. Here we go. A pistol. Don't mind. It's not loaded. Everyone has one. I've got three. My kids got two. Everyone has one. Are they really that dangerous? In the right hands, a pistol is completely harmless, as we all know. In the wrong hands, it can be more of a utensil for death. The prosecution would have you believe that my client took a pistol, not unlike this one, after stapling the victim to a wall, after brushing the victim's hair, and then taking a feather and bringing it lightly down, lightly down the victim's face. That he then took a pistol, aimed it at the victim's head, and that's the noise of a gun. Set it off. I'm not asking you whether or not a gun can kill. I'm asking you whether or not a person can kill. There is the old popular saying that is true now more than ever. If guns don't kill people, people kill people. Then, if toasters don't toast, 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 toast. And there is a... A clairvoyance to that phrase. A salience that permeates the entire structure of our beautiful country. Toasters don't toast, 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 toast. Now, if you believe that toasters toast, toast, and that toast doesn't toast, toast, but toast, 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 and toasters toast it, then perhaps my client took this gun, aimed it at the head of the victim after stapling them to the wall, after combing their hair, after brushing a feather down their face, maybe, but can you say beyond reasonable doubt, without plausible deniability? And without any trace of residual firework powder, gunpowder, 
that he did it. That, after stapling the victim to the wall, after taking a brush and gently, lovingly brushing down the victim's hair, then taking a feather and ever so gently brushing it down the person's face, that he took a gun, not unlike this one, pointed it at the victim and Is a goldfish. <laughs> 